You know, these past five or six months or thereabouts, I just, I haven't been able to shake this weird feeling that I've forgotten something, something important, something big that I was supposed to, to comment on or make a video about or something, or... Uh, oh. Oh. Right. We once again return to the field of revolution, where the British regulars have finally begun their assault on the rebel lines. And now before we get to the ridiculous amount of farbery in the scene, I do want to qualify it with something. Being that there is also an awful lot within the scene that I really, really love. But to keep things thematic, in this video I will be exclusively speaking about the multitude of inaccuracies. And then in another video, hopefully within the next half year this time, uh, I will discuss what I do like about this scene. So first things first, why on earth is there such a ridiculous amount of space between each rank here? Whenever a man is hit in the front rank, the man behind him, you see, has to run forward to take his place. Assuming that these men are even able to keep track of where their file partners are from such a distance, a file partner being the man in front of you whom, well, you're supposed to take the place of if he falls, and also, of course, take your dressing from, you know, keeping in line with the man in front of you, which keeping track of these file partners would be very difficult in a battle scenario and cause confusion in a situation like this on who even has to advance to occupy the space when a man in the front rank falls, well, it would also prove unnecessarily difficult to actually keep the ranks in line with one another. This is one of the reasons why, when you're marching in two or three ranks, even if you're in open order, you generally want to have your files very close together. Another similar reason would be to avoid the problem that we're seeing right now. Whenever a man in the front rank falls, when the ranks are so horribly far spread, watch how long it takes for the rear man to come forward to take the place of the front man. Rather than merely extending their pace one or two steps to take up the open, uh, the open space, thus filling it rapidly and preventing the line from losing its overall dressing, there is a period of a few seconds where that front space is left open, as a number of very extended strides need to be taken. In that time, the front rank can bunch up. It can lose its spacing, thus making it more difficult for the second rank man to actually fill the gap when he runs up. Let alone, as we see here, if two or three even more men should fall, which of course would already prove highly dangerous to alliance cohesion, even if the ranks were in proper distance to each other. But when you have to have five or six men from the rear rank take those numerous steps to take up a massive gap in the front rank, there's a long period of time there, and many variables which can cause the front rank to bunch up, and all of a sudden you have two or three men who are sort of left in between two ranks, and they can't fill the space. Next, while I appreciate the smoke in some of these shots, as it appears very thick and obscures the battlefield, well, other times we get scenes like this, where it is just painfully obvious that these men are either not firing full powder charges, or uh, far more likely they're not using real black powder, or there's some sort of movie magic going on. Uh, and not only are the puffs of smoke coming from these arms very, very tiny, but notice how quickly they disappear. It isn't just being blown away by very rapid winds, it's just disappearing, whereas black powder smoke has a very strong tendency to linger for a good long while, and even in very strong winds, when you have an entire line of men firing like that, the field will become obscured. However, of course, to the scene's credit, you can see here that the men are actually shown using flintlocks when close up. Now that sort of movie magic I, I do appreciate, when you have a limited number of muskets using camera angles to make it look like all of the men have them. And as a confirmation from an earlier suspicion I had in the first video, where an exceptionally large gun was being manned by less than a skeleton crew, uh, here we have a different gun which seems to be in even worse condition with only one man to operate it. Uh, for the same reasons listed earlier, this is exceptionally silly, as even with manpower shortages, you would simply not be able to operate a gun like this with only one man, at least not beyond a single shot for how long it would take to do all 
all of those steps, to say nothing, of course, of how dangerous it would be for only one man to do all of those steps. And again, if you'd like more detail on those steps, I do have a video on that subject. Uh, you'll see the, uh, the name of it in the corner there, and uh, I'll throw the link down in the description below. Why not? Now, finally, after enduring a hellish fire, the regulars come within effective range of the enemy fortifications, and they shall offer up a volley before taking the day with a zealous bayonet charge in true British fashion. And so the command comes! Regiment! Halt! What? Regiment halt. What what sort of a command is that? Uh, first off, everything that our sergeant major has said so far indicates that all of these men represent a single regiment, and while certainly possible, given that, well, we have in this line a company of grenadiers, a company of lights on the left, as we're going to see them later on, and, well, the center is made up of all the battalion men, and you know, the scale looks more or less right, I suppose. It, even still, it's highly improbable that you would ever have an entire regiment in a single engagement like this, and in a single place on the field. The ten companies within a regiment, which were nigh on never at full strength, would always be shifted around, brigaded with other companies of other regiments, and as, and as such often operating independently of other aspects of their same regiment. Your grenadier company might be off raiding the countryside somewhere, while your lights are drilling in the field somewhere, learning a new method. Uh, meanwhile, two battalion companies are on garrison duty in the city, and another highly depleted battalion company uh, could be back in England for recruiting duties, all that sort of thing. The only time you could really expect to see an entire regiment in one place, or at least as close as you'd ever get, would probably just be during peacetime or at a, a regimental review of some sort, say, before a deployment or after a deployment. And even if there was only a single regiment present here to be commanded, with with no others there to cause confusion at so incredibly broad a command, it would probably still be the case that this regiment would be addressed by its number, its designation, its name, which would be a thing of pride for the men. So not only does the address of this command, regiment, make no sense at all with how incredibly broad and generic it is, but there's also no preparatory command to speak of. When you simply shout, regiment halt, you could end up, to put it simply, surprising a lot of the men who would not be ready to actually stop their advance at the word of execution. Some men would halt in the proper timing, others would probably take another half step or more. It, not a big deal, and honestly I'm sure it's something that would have happened an awful lot in a real battlefield, because not everyone has uh, time for the full formalities when you're being actively fired upon as the regulars are here, but still it would have been more appropriate to have the command come as, by example, 54th take care, halt, because when you give the men uh, notice that a command is coming like that, their immediate execution, which is what we see here, an immediate execution, would make an awful lot more sense. But the way it's done here makes it feel just a little more rehearsed than I would like, a little too perfect, if you will. It would have been nice to see a command to dress after the halt, and to have the line shuffle itself back together to reflect the idea that the men were moving through uneven terrain and had so sudden a command given to them. It would have also been really nice to see this command echoed through the ranks by NCOs as appropriate to let the know men that they were halting, because odds are, you know, if there's a man in the light company all the way on the other end of the formation, he's not going to be hearing when the sergeant major on the far right shouts to halt. That's why you have NCOs to echo those commands. That's why you have musicians to carry the commands across a very wide and chaotic battlefield. But here, we really don't see how any of that, you know, mechanism works. It's only the sergeant major shouting, and it's presumed that everyone can hear him 100% perfectly. And now, well, now it gets bad. Really bad. We have another command. The sergeant major cries to poise muskets. The men do not poise their muskets. You see, in every drill manual I have ever seen, the position of poise looks like this. The musket is brought up before the face with the lock turned outwards, one's left hand just above the lock and the right at the swell. Poise 
is not a battlefield command. It serves no functional purpose on a battlefield. It is most commonly used as a transitionary movement from the shoulder to the present, as in the saluting kind of present, not the firing one. And it's also used in reenactment for our safety checks, as officers will go up and down the ranks, making sure everyone's muskets uh, aren't able to go off at the half cock when they push the triggers down. While it is kind of similar to the recover, which is very much a battle carry of the musket, the poise has absolutely no combat function. Uh, but thankfully, of course, upon receiving the command to poise muskets, and incidentally the command should have been poise your firelocks, not poise muskets, well, none of the men actually obey that very silly command. Instead, they come to the make ready as they ought to with this sort of situation. Uh, do note, however, that for some godforsaken reason, after coming to the halt, all of the men seem to have immediately gone to the order as opposed to remaining at the shoulder, which we didn't even see or hear a command for. And this makes their coming to the make ready a lot more clunky than as if they had uh, done so from the shoulder as they ought to have done. But these aren't the only ways in which the soldiers have completely disregarded their orders while simultaneously acting as some strangely free-spirited hive mind, uh, sort of doing their own thing but all collectively, because of course the entire front rank also seems to take this order as an opportunity to preemptively kneel, again without being told to do so by anyone. Then our sergeant major seems to have finally remembered the language in his own drill manuals and corrects his previous command by ordering the men, who have already done so, to make ready. And of course the men respond to this command by promptly coming to the present instead. The first rank is ordered to fire in appropriate fashion and the command is executed, no trouble there. And so we move to the second rank. I don't really see why the sergeant major wouldn't have just had all three ranks fire all at once and then charge in as one, delivering a single, more devastating volley to the foe before pushing in with a rush to truly overwhelm the enemy, as this was oftentimes how historically these sorts of things were done. If you have two ranks, you have both of them fire at once and then you push in. Um, but I suppose he did have to allow proper time to lock up the ranks so they can, well, actually fire. And it can also be argued, I suppose, that there is a morale factor of having three distinct volleys crashing into the enemy. Well, you see, he wouldn't have to face this delay, though, uh, if, like I said earlier, he'd just made sure that his ranks were in proper dressing to start with, instead of with these massive gaps between each individual line. So now what the sergeant major has to do, rather than having three rapid volleys or one devastating volley, well, he has to take precious more seconds in which his men will continue being fired upon to bring up the second and third ranks so that they can fire... wait... Wait, 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 Sergeant, Sergeant Major, no, Sergeant Major, you, you can't give the command, to, you, you cannot give the command to fire just yet. Sergeant Major, you cannot have the musket men fire over top of their fellows' heads like that. It, this is just asking for disaster. If any one of them drops their pieces even just a little, and at this time period, it was woefully common for men to aim too low anyways. This, this is ridiculous. Sergeant Major, you have to lock your men up. To say nothing of the scorching of the powder discharging from the front of the barrel there, you'll be burning and scalding half your men. Uh, those bearskins could well catch fire if anyone the, in the front ranks is just a little bit too tall. Oh, dear lord. Oh, oh, dear lord, he went and did it. Well, congratulations, Sergeant Major. You've probably just killed off a couple of your own men with friendly fire, and you've set the rest of their ears ringing and the backs of their necks singeing with powder burns. And then he goes and has the third rank fire without locking up either. It's very possible, it is very possible, to fire in three ranks, but you need to have the men in proper distance from one another. With the distance between the third and first ranks being even more massive than between the second and first, the likelihood of friendly fire would be even worse that way. And I certainly hope that the second rank had the sense to kneel, because heaven knows our sergeant major didn't give them the command to do so, and if the enlisted man were just following the commands as they were given, you know exactly what an enlisted man is meant and trained to do, uh, the entire basis of formation fighting, following orders exactly as they come, well then the third rank just shot the second rank in the back, unless every single one of them was so incredible a marksman as to be able to fire between the shoulders of the men in front of them 
them with a smoothbore musket in a battlefield. <sighs> right, right. Uh, well, whatever that nonsense was, it, it's followed up by the first rebel line collapsing, as the militiamen are shown being shot down while they flee, and uh, next, of course, a random battalion man who uh, looks like a corporal with his shoulder knot there, uh, who doesn't even have his coat pinned shut, and says just loosely hanging down like some sort of slovenly... Well, in any case, uh, he, he walks up to our sergeant major for no discernible reason, um, but he certainly does look very intimidating, doesn't he? And um, uh, as he does this, of course, you can hear our sergeant major in the distance issue the command to order arms. Order arms! Which the men actually obey him correctly this time, although in an instance where, once again, they probably ought not to have done so. Um, why would you have the men come to the order when you plan to have them push in with bayonets? I understand having them come to the shoulder or to the recover before having them charge, but having them go to the order is completely nonsensical in this way. Uh, and of course, after firing, if you don't order the men to prime and load, well, they'll just default to either the shoulder or the recover, depending on those prior commands. And Again, the sergeant major is simply making things more complicated for himself. And uh, that one, by the by, should be charge your bayonets, sergeant major, N not present. There is no command of present bayonets. And since when did the first and second ranks get the command to spring up? Well, I suppose they just stood back up of their own volition when they were senselessly being told to order arms. Now again we have a big problem, uh, coming from the fact that these ranks are not properly locked up. You see, again, when you have a proper line, where the numerous ranks are in proper distance, you can't have every man charge his bayonet like this. Only the front rank can, because only they actually have the room in front of them. In this command, when the front rank actually comes to the charge, any subsequent ranks actually raise up their arms and come to the recover, ready to, at a moment's notice, step up into the front man's place, should he fall, and lower his bayonet to the charge. But in this sort of situation, if a front rank man falls and the rear rank man has to take his place, he's running forward with his bayonet leveled, well, I'm sure that we can see how that might prove troublesome, especially if the front rank clumps up at all, as previously discussed. And not only does our sergeant major seem very inclined to shooting his own men in the back, he also seems inclined to have them be accidentally bayoneted in the back as well. Uh, but finally, the push with bayonets begins. Uh, the men advance at a quick march, and it is in proper time, which I do appreciate that, it's in proper time. Uh, though, as they get closer, they probably ought to quicken their pace to a march march, which they do not. And, of course, for more details on that sort of thing, uh, see part two, where I discuss the different marching speeds of the 18th century in greater detail, the slow march, quick march, and the march march. And, of course, given that these men are advancing in a very clear, quick march that we can hear very distinctly in the background, I have no clue what this kid here is doing. It looks as though he's trying to sound an assembly or some such. I, I don't know. Oh, and this shot is a really good one. Now, if only, again, there was a second rank behind these men with arms at the recover. So you can see the bayonets, you know, uh, thrusting up into the sky with the uh, front row, you know, nice and leveled against the enemy. And if they were wearing their hats uh, correctly cocked to the side as opposed to facing straight forward like this. Oh, it would just, it would be perfect as opposed to just pretty decent, which is what we have here. And from here, the American second line also begins to immediately falter and break in the sight of the approaching red line. Now, I have no clue where this fellow's going with that flag, but otherwise, I really love this part of the scene, and honestly, most of what we're going to be seeing going forward, uh, but again, we'll talk about the good bits in our fourth and final part. Now, I don't know how, but our sergeant major seems to have found his way from the extreme right of the formation to the extreme left, given that he's now among light infantry. But hey, at least they show the light infantry, so they have that going for them, because we don't oftentimes see portrayals of British light infantrymen in this war. Now, while not really Farby, it isn't usually a good idea 
for a force to break ranks so openly like this and just take off running, because if your foe happens to reassemble and actually stand their ground, well, it could put you into a fair bit of trouble, especially if you overextend too much from that charge. Indeed, we do see here the rebels trying to reform, although it is too little too late for them. So, given the scenario, it is understandable that we have this uh, outright uh, zealous, very um, eager charge from the men who are most likely very keen to get into the action, as it were, and give the enemy what for. And finally, as the rebel forces flee into the woods, utterly broken, the regulars let out a cheer of jubilation and relief that they have not only survived their battle, but come out as victorious. And I like that. We have a portrayal here of British troops as more than just mindless drones, but as actual men. And finally, of course, the colors and the band are shown following up behind the lines, and the command comes to reform at the colors. Good, except I would have liked to see, instead, the band coming to a halt, and on the issuing of the command to reassemble at the colors, uh, for the band to begin sounding the assembly, a long and continuous rolling of the drums calling the men back to their formation. Instead, it seems that the men are just going to reform at the colors while they're still actually moving, which will probably prove rather difficult for them. Well, all right, everyone, that collectively took quite a while, and I'm sure that still I missed a good couple of things that I could have talked about. But I think that, oh, what, probably about an hour or so of my pedantically complaining about a scene that's less than ten minutes long altogether, well, that should be far more than sufficient across these three videos. Though, again, despite all of my complaining, all of these problems from the tiny and the genuinely insignificant to the hilariously bad, as I've said before, there are actually an awful lot of pieces of the scene that I genuinely really love. Many aspects which, even if the writers didn't do sufficient research into things like battlefield commands and maneuvers, show that at least on some level they did have a, re a, a respect for this period of history. And honestly, when it comes to historical films, I do think that that, that respect, is one of the most important factors. Although, given other scenes and other characters in this overall movie, it's also very clear that this respect was less than perfect and sporadic at best. Uh, but in any case, I think the question of historical authenticity and respect, as opposed to outright accuracy, will be a one for another day, uh, preferably again within the next three months or so this time. Uh, but, of course, until that day, my dear viewer, uh, while I may not be the most prolific of creators, I understand, uh, I, I am still, and of course I shall remain, your most humble and obedient of servants.